Um, Dr. Paul Evans is not here tonight, but I'm Carrie Roller. Um, I'm Science yeah. Mathematics Education Institute, and I'm introducing Dr. James Balthazor. He is from he is Associate Professor of Biochemistry and Molecular Biophysics. It's a lot. It is. It kind of did not work. Mm -hmm. so. There's chairs up front. Don't feel bad. I'll Don't, come back here. I wouldn't stand I'll the whole back. time. So I defer, I will give him Awesome. Oh, well, thank you for coming. I, I really did campaign against folks coming. This whole front table, I said, would fail if they showed up, yet they showed up anyway. Um, so, everybody can hear me okay? Excellent. So, uh, just as Carrie introduced me, I'm the K Ember Campus Coordinator. I do a lot with um, helping undergraduates get some funding for biomedical research and cellular molecular biology. Um, and a little bit of biochem too, try to pull them into the chemistry department and steal from biology any chance I get. Uh, but we, really it's the collective goal of doing some science and uh, involving students. So today, uh, I am a farm boy from western Kansas, so I'm not going to go heavy into the science. And I'm going to try to keep it as low key as possible. So you can ask me questions, you can interrupt me at any time, and I'm happy to go on and uh, explain things. So that's what we're here for. So. I'm going to try my farm boy approach and try to keep it as low key as possible, but still hit some high points of the science. So the first thing that I'm going to talk about is I'm basically going to break this down into two parts. I'm going to talk about bees, obviously, because that's the nature of the talk. And then I'm going to break it down. I'll talk a little bit more about the science itself. And I'm sure you've heard through the times that the bees are important. They're very vital for our survival for food production. And that's why folks want to try to save the bees. I'll be honest, it's low hanging fruit. There's lots of funding there. And it's a good way for me to involve students to do dissections. Because the cool thing about insects is you don't have to have IUCOC approval to do research on them. And you can just kill as many as you want and no one cares. So we kill literally hundreds of thousands, not bees, but aphids a year. Um, and bees are kind of our pet project. And then we'll, we'll talk really about the problem, why there's some factors that lead to colony collapse, which we're trying to help mitigate. We probably won't have the silver bullet, but we might have a little bit that we can help out with. And then we'll talk about the science of what I do, what I did for my PhD, um, and hopefully be able to answer some questions for you. So for the first part, let's talk about bees. Why are bees so important? Bees are important because they are a vital pollinator. So not everything is pollinated by the wind. It's not like you can go out into a cornfield and see a whole bunch of bees. That's pollinated by the wind. And it's pretty boring. But bees, bees, that's our Apis mellifera is our scientific name for them, or the Western honeybee, or the European honeybee. They're a bee that is the most common one that we see used for agricultural use. So we literally farm bees and bees are going to be um, really complex individuals that communicate through dance and through smells and it's a, a eulosocial network meaning that there is one lady in charge and she takes care of everybody and she makes sure things go right. It's very similar to my house. There's one lady in charge, she makes sure everything goes right and um, the drone, if I am, really has the best life in the world. So we'll talk a little bit about it. So if you look at a common hive, they're all pretty much ladies. They're all female workers and that progeny comes along and they do their job and there's very few males, which are the drones. Drones have the best job in the world. They mate and then they basically live and eat for a while until everybody kicks them out and say, good luck dying over the winter. We'll make new males next year and we don't need you anymore. But all of that's controlled by the queen. And to get a queen, a queen is pretty simple. You use a little bit of chemistry. The bees probably don't talk about chemistry, but the amount of lipids and sugars and the different components that you have 
have in a royal jelly differentiates a normal lady into a queen. So there's nurse bees that come along and they, sorry to break your bubble if you don't know it, bee, bee vomit is honey. They spit and puke into a hive and this, this royal jelly which is composed of these components basically differentiates what makes a queen a queen. And she'll go a couple, maybe a season or two before she's replaced and she'll actually make her replacement and she'll take a portion of the hive and take off, take off, excuse me, and um, try to start new. So this is where the problem comes in. A lot of times we have a colony collapse because we're just losing too much of the hive or the queen will die, which is not a great thing. I can tell you from experience, if you go to a hive that doesn't have a queen, they're pretty angry. They like to sting a lot. The bonus is, is everybody that works on this project is allergic to bees. So um, we have EpiPens in the lab. Works out pretty well for us. We try not to get stung. You can slow a bee down really well if you throw them in a freezer and they tend to not sting you quite so much. So that's kind of how we manipulate them a little bit. But the real reason why bees are so important is because what they do for us. They're a major pollinator for our food. Who loves almonds? I mean, almonds are amazing. I love them, especially when my wife makes them with all that sugar and cinnamon stuff on them that makes it really bad for us. Um, but the majority of our almond crops in the United States are pollinated all by bees. Literally, bee farmers will come in, set up their bees in the orchards, however they, however they do this, and they let their bees pollinate all these trees and all these plants to allow us to eat. So, you know, forget about the honey, the pollen, the royal jelly. It's really about us. We need the bees so we can eat, um, especially the more people we are kicking out into this world, the less resources that we're going to have. So bees are going to be very vital for this. And they are actually farmed just like livestock. So does anybody here have a hive by chance? In the back, we have some people with hives over here with some hives. It's a lot of fun. Um, I like to stay in the car when I go see the hives. <laughs> I let my brother do all of that. He likes getting stung, uh, but I don't. I don't really care for it. There's a lot of things that affect these bees. We're one of them. We are changing our habitat, and whether you buy into um, climate change or getting rid of cropland to put urban areas, we're really just hard on the environment for the natural habitat and that's just that's the bonus I guess of being a human the other problem is is we like to make food and try to spray bees and try to get rid of them and those insecticides that they're using are actually neotichinoids um, so imagine a souped up version of what's in your cigarette and that's what they spray on these fields as well as organophosphates so if you go back to World War II, Taubin gas, that's an organophosphate. Not really the best thing to spray um, for humans or bees, but it tends to have a, a really negative effect. And this is when that Zika outbreak happened. Oh, this is 2016. They were spraying like crazy, trying to kill all those mosquitoes that were really spreading around Zika virus. But in the on the off problem is that we were having off-target effects on honeybees. And lots and lots of honeybees were just dying from the spraying that was done. So the science that we're trying to do is do the same thing and kill a problem, pest, without killing the honeybee. So we're going to talk about the problems that we see with bees and the effectors that affect bees. And one of those is us. Obviously humans, we spray insecticides. And there are viruses, you know, viruses such as uh, varroa, uh, the deformed wing virus, um, and there's Oh, cloudy wing virus. There's tons of different viruses that you can see in bees. But the main one that I care about are parasites. So, parasites are 
for lack of a better word, little spiders that infest your bees. So you can have external ones, which are called Varroa. Those are really easy to get to. They're on the outside of your bee. You can literally pluck them off with a tweezer. We've done a little bit of work with Varroa mites, but what I really like to do is work on the internal bees, which are tracheal mites, and we'll talk a little bit about the tracheal mite itself. So, to get a tracheal mite, you have to kill a bee to try to save it. So that's the title, why it came from the talk. Why do we try to save bees by killing them? Well, because you have to cut their head off to get to the mites that are in there. But in the future, what we hope is that we can feed these bees this diet with our uh, double-stranded RNA, and we can kill any parasite, internal or external, that is around. So, these little mites, internal mites, a carpus woodi, is a type of arachnid. And they live in the trachea of a honeybee. So imagine if you try to take a nice deep breath in and you've got something living inside of your trachea, drinking your blood from the inside, and just really clogging up and giving you the nice, nasty lung infection but it's a living lung infection. And they tend to lay quite a few eggs, and then they have these eggs. The females will crawl out of the, the bee, out of their side of their spiracles, and they'll crawl into a new bee and infect more. Around our area, about two out of 10 bees are infected with tracheomites. So we try to, we kill 80% of the bees just trying to find the ones with tracheal mites, which is kind of a bad deal, but it's good for the students because there's a lot of practice and dissection. So, once we have a female, she lays her eggs in there, she'll crawl out. Now, the, the trachea of a bee is a little bit different than you and I. They don't breathe out of their mouth. So these little blue sections here are the trachea. When they take a breath, they breathe through the side of their body, through a spiracle. So the mite will crawl out of their spiracle, hop on some hair, and they'll bump into their neighbor, and they'll infect their neighbor, and it will crawl inside that bee and lay eggs and perpetuate the cycle. What we're trying to do is get to this first thoracic trachea because it's the easiest one to get to. We can get to the other ones, but for the most part, we try to go for the low-hanging fruit. So, we have a microscope system, thanks to the Worth College, paid for that when I first got hired. Dr. Dixon's here, thank you. Um, and we have, oh, I hit the button here. We have this system that we can magnify. Uh, you can't see the bee there, but there's a bee under there. There's a fiber optic system, so it doesn't heat up your sample, it doesn't degrade. Because everything about what we're going to do scientifically, we don't want it to degrade and fall apart. And I work with RNA. RNA, and you can ask Dr. Stewart, RNA is kind of a booger, it falls apart, it tends to um, degrade very rapidly, about 200 nanograms a minute, we usually get about 1400 to 3000 nanograms out of a bee, and so you kind of have to be on your toes when you're working with it. So there is a learning curve for students. If you, well this is kind of a hard picture to see, but this is a bee trachea. And these three little specks are actual tracheal mites in a dissected trachea. And it's kind of hard to see, so I thought the best way to show this would be to show you a dissection. So I had my grad student, uh, Jared, he's gone now, he's in a PhD program. Uh, isolate on video, which was really hard to dissect a bee while holding a video camera on his face. Um, I dissect him. So if you're a little squeamish about seeing a bee cut, its, cut apart, um, I'll ask you to look away, but it's so cool to see them tore apart. It's not, a, it's not cool, but it's, it's really interesting. So what we're going to be looking for are the first thoracic trachea. So I'll try to um, point them out as we go here, but these little look like 
Oh, what do they got? An ape hanger on a chopper, right? A big set of handlebars hanging out there. Those are the trachea. So we come in here and we rip the head off of our little lady here, and we try to orient her into a position where we can see um, the first thoracic trachea. So here, we've taken the live bee, we throw it into the freezer, we're slowing her down a little bit so she doesn't sting us, and we're trying to um, essentially peel back that thoracic cavity. So my students here know what's the exoskeleton of an insect made of? Oh, puts you on the spot. Chitin, look at you. Carbohydrates, I'm so proud of you. So it's in acetyl glucosamine that's made there and it's just a whole bunch of sugar. So if you ever had to eat a bee, they're really good for you. It's lots of sugar, lots of proteins. And you get this nice gooey pulp on the inside. So bee's a little bit different than me and you. A bee has an open circulatory system. You are a walking bag of pipes. A bee is an open system where it basically is like a sump pump on an engine. If you think about it, it pumps the fluid from the bottom to the top of the bee and it just bathes everything, which is great for a tracheal mite. Pokes its mouth through the trachea and it's just like sticking a bendy straw into the trachea of the flock, into the trachea of your bee, and you just get a drink and drink and drink. Drink your hemolymph to your heart's content. So this is one of those thoracic, well, he pulled one out there. This is one of the first thoracic vertebrae, and this is what we're looking for. So this is a clear trachea. There are no tracheal mites in that trachea. This trachea has a couple little circles, those little blobs, those are the tracheal mites. And you can see that over time, just like any infection or any parasite that's living in you, they're going to scar you and they're going to leave some lasting effects. So how do we get this stopped? Well, A, we have to kill the bee so we can get the tracheal mite. Varroa mites, the ones that are on the outside, they've been sequenced. So if you imagine the Human Genome Project, they did that years ago. Now imagine the tracheal mite project. So that's the first step that we're going to do. So I'll talk a little bit about now the science that what we're doing in the lab. And the first step is we've isolated tracheal mites. It's kind of hard to do. Um, there's a lot of bees that have been killed. And trying to get them isolated without them degraded has been a challenge. We have now gotten to a point where we're ready to send them off for sequencing. We don't do that at Fort Hayes. Um, we don't have a sequencer. I would love to talk to Dr. Dixon about getting a sequencer. Um, they're only like $190,000 for a really cheap one that doesn't have the parts that we need. Um, you know, half a million would really, we'll talk later. <laughs> but a sequencer would be wonderful. Um, actually, more than that. But I would like to get an Illumina sequencer where we could do this in-house. And then you have students like Jacob comes along where they do bioinformatics and they literally build the genome. Back in the day, they spent hundreds of millions of dollars trying to get the Human Genome Project. We can do it for less than five grand. And the computing time takes time but we can generate that sequence. So that's a little bit about what we're starting to work on. The other thing is what I do for a living or for my research and that I work on the unfolded protein response. So now we're gonna kind of shift gears away from the bees and talk a little bit about how I plan to kill tracheal mites without killing the bee. And it's not just mites that we're going after. We have projects with feral pigs. We have projects with crop insects. You know, my mom and dad, they've been farmers forever. Um, they're retired now, but you kind of got to keep mom and dad happy and keep the pests off their wheat so they can make some money. Uh, and that's kind of what we're gearing for. So before I jump into that, I want to talk about basic biology 180, principles of biology at Fort Hayes State University. Learn about the anatomy of a cell. Hoo doggy. So, where is the unfolded protein response? The unfolded protein response lives in the endoplasmic reticulum. Quite, uh, quite a lot of it in this cell, and we see that that is where we have ribosomes, and ribosomes make proteins. And any good biochemist will say, proteins are the most important molecule in the world. So proteins are where it's at. Proteins are the same thing as your enzymes, right? 
enzymes do our jobs for us? Well, proteins are what we need to do the work inside of our body, whether you're a tracheomite, a pig, or a human. And what I want to do is knock those things out, stop them from being totally produced using a double-stranded RNA method. So a protein only works when it's folded correctly. So primary structure dictates tertiary structure. I'm so proud of you. Four years of college is really paying off, guys. So primary structure, the sequence of amino acids determines how a protein is going to work. And to keep it as simple as possible, a protein that is folded correctly works. A protein that is unfolded doesn't work. Right? So, if you look at the egg white around an egg, that's called albumin, that's the protein that it is, and if you denature it, cook it, you can't get it to refold. It will never look like that sweet, snotty goodness on the left. It will always be, gosh, I hope they cook those eggs a little more for me, but it'll also, it'll always be this denatured protein, something that we just can't undo. So we can induce what's called the unfolded protein response when we force enough of this to happen or if we shut off proteins from being made. So to go back to principles of biology, we think about how DNA is made and how RNA is made and how proteins are made. So DNA is our storing information. We make RNA, it's like our blueprint to make a protein and then the blueprint is what we're trying to shut down. So we're trying to stop the messenger from happening. And what we're really trying to do is make the cell to decide, am I going to live or am I going to die? The unfolded protein response works by either overwhelming the system and you have proteins that come in like chaperones and they try to refold things and they try to get your cell to live. But your cell is pretty amazing. It is, it's a go, no, go. And I, you think about watching Apollo 13, Fido, go, you know. A cell is like, hey, I can't do this anymore. Instead of trying, I'm just gonna kill myself and let somebody else take over. And that's what cells do. That's called programmed cell death or apoptosis. So the cell will hopefully, in our case, decide, hey, you know what? He, he did a really good job knocking out my proteins. I'm not going to bounce back from this, and I'm going to kill myself. Well, if you get all the cells in the organism to do that, you kill the organism, right? So our goal is to specifically target an organism. You're an organism. You're a human. I can't say I want to kill that guy over that guy. I could kill the whole room. I'd be really good at that, but I can't be picky and choosy. But I can say I only want to kill people and not, you know, golden doodles. I like dogs, right? But we're not trying to kill people. What we are trying to do is make something called double-stranded RNA. So this is what we talked about. This is the central dogma of biology. It's on every master's orals defense, Danica. It's coming. <laughs> so central dogma of biology. DNA makes RNA. RNA makes proteins. We stop that from happening. So we take some RNA out of an organism and we make complementary DNA which is double-stranded and then we make an abomination of double-stranded RNA. Double-stranded RNA, we chop it up into little pieces. We don't. Your body does it for us. It's a system that's in everything from yeast all the way up to you and we utilize this system to deliver a Basically, it plugs up the works, so you can't make the protein you want. You have a single-stranded RNA, and you hook a little bit of a double-stranded RNA piece to it, or a little piece of that double-stranded RNA, and it doesn't fit through the ribosome to make proteins. Without proteins, the organism has to die. The hard part is finding the right gene. That's where lots and lots of time reading and 
trial and error, trying to figure out what works. The bonus is, is we've narrowed it down to the unfolded protein response. My thought during my THD was, is it makes sense if you shut down the system that's going to save you, and then they'll die. That's kind of what I thought. So I go after proteins in the unfolded protein response. During my PhD, I identified about 140 of them, and now I have students trying each of those genes on aphids, on pigs, on honeybees, trying to kill specific organisms. And the, the kicker is, is we don't want off-target targets. We don't want to kill, for the case of feral pigs, feral pigs do a lot of damage but we don't want to kill all the coyotes that are going to eat the carcasses or the crows or the vultures or maybe even the people. You could take a jar of double-stranded RNA that's made for tracheomites of honeybees or for feral pigs and drink the whole thing down and hopefully we did it right. It doesn't do anything to you but it goes right through your system. So that's kind of what we're doing. So the hard part is where you get into bioinformatics. I would recommend genetics with Dr. Stewart. And you get to learn about sequence alignments. And you have to compare every organism there is and try to figure out where can I produce a piece of RNA that will only kill the organism that I want. Now we're looking at making sections of RNA, double-stranded RNA, that are 21 nucleotides long. So each one of these letters represent an amino acid that's coded by nucleotides. So methionine, serine, whatever you want to look at, you can look at these and we want to find a sequence area that is not going to be complementary with a different organism. That's why we have to have it sequenced, right? We got to know what we're shooting for and we have to know the other things that have been sequenced to make sure that they are not going to line up. Now, this is amino acid residue. So imagine each amino acid residue would be broken down into three nucleotides, either an A, T, C, or G, depending on what nucleotide codes for that amino acid. So we look for 21 of them that are only found for one organism. There's a lot of similarities. If you pick the wrong gene, you will not only kill the organism that you want, but you could kill yeast. And if you're here in the brewing business, you probably don't want to kill your yeast or humans. That would be a no-no. Tends to be hard to get refunding if you kill the funding people. Um, and that's what the hardest part is. Trying to make sure that we are not killing things that we don't want to kill. Now the delivery part's a little bit unique too. I was fortunate enough when I was at K-State doing my doctorate that the guy across the hall invented something to deliver double-stranded RNA into organisms. It's the only one really that has shown to work and my lab and one lab in Finland and one in China, all of which who talk to me frequently, um, want to know how we get it to do it. And we use what's called a BAPSI. So now we've designed our double-stranded RNA, but now you have to get it into an organism. When I first started out, we used to take a needle and inject aphids. And let me tell you, injecting an aphid, there's no better feeling to watch one explode when you give way too much liquid. So when we think about how much we're injecting, we're injecting a femtoliter, 10 to the negative 15th. And I don't tell my students this, but you do it with your mouth. You have this long tube with a glass needle, and you touch your tongue to the tube, and that tends to deliver anywhere from 1 to 30 femtoliters, and you get to see if you exploded an aphid. It's really hard to knock out a whole field of aphids by injecting them one at a time. So we had to come up with this way for this to happen. So we use this branched amphiphilic peptide capsule and our DNA wraps around it. And we figured out at certain temperatures we can set it to a specific size that an insect will eat and take into their diet. So we can kill aphids. We can kill anything that's inside the bee too. A bee that's in there, 
an aphid, a tracheal mite, it doesn't matter. As long as you get it into their stomach, it makes it into their circulatory system. We've dissected them, we've seen where it goes. And the DNA stays bound until it releases and it starts plugging up the works. And that's what we're really going for. So, I have a little bit of time here that I'm, I'm going to leave it for answering questions, but really what the title of the talk was, Saving Bees by Killing Them, that's going to end soon. The hard part's done. We've isolated the tracheal mites. We've been able to get their DNA sequenced or started to get it sequenced. And now the gravy train part is to get some patents, make some money for the university, retire and never teach. Oh, no, I'm joking. <laughs> teach some biochem and involve students, right? So that's really what we're fo focusing on now. So where we're at with our feral pig project and with our bee project is trying to figure out which gene kind of works, right? So we've identified 27 of the 125-ish. There's more, there's some I don't tell students about. Those are the ones that I hide for myself. We've done lots of different little projects. Most of them know the name of their gene. The ones that work really well, they probably will never know the name of their gene until it's patented. And really, I let them pick. I say, go in there, find a gene that you think we want to knock down out of this 125, and we'll try it. So what we do is we, we take these various different tests that we've done and we take the information and we try to use it in different organisms. This would be great to get a patent in one organism, but if it works for everything, why not tweak it a little bit and make another patent and make another patent. And someday when I'm on a big yacht somewhere sending checks to Fort Hayes, it'll be a great day as we'll have lots of almonds. <laughs> and I love almonds and we'll be able to do this. The cool thing about bees as a test bed is that they're easy to feed. You have a hive and on the top of the box there's a super is what they call it. They put sugar water in there. You just squirt the diet right into the sugar water and check it later to see if it worked. The varroa mites are easy. Literally when we give a treatment to varroa mites they will be down in the bottom of the hive. There's dead varroa mites in the bottom of the hive. Tracheal mites, a little bit harder. You gotta kill the bee to check to make sure it worked. Do I think that tracheal mites are the ones that are more important to go after than the external varroa mites? No, not really, just nobody else is doing it. So I'm trying to corner the market that nobody else wants to do. Who wants to sit and dissect a thousand bees? Undergrads. <laughs> undergrads that's who <laughs> to be fair my my time in grad school I died my professor made me dissect a lot of insects so it's only fair that I get to pass that wealth on <laughs> so we get it delivered easily there are some problems a we don't want to kill each other that would be a bad thing um, bees don't really like to live inside they tend to have problems when they escape the lab and they do they get out every now and then. Um, they don't live as long. We have Dixie cups full of fake comb and we will raise bees in there and we can get a couple weeks out of a Dixie cup um, and we just have some syringes with some sugar water in there and they they tend to be okay. Problem is is they don't have a queen around them so they're a little bit hyped up most of the time. Hyped up bees are not the most fun to work with. And then the last thing that most everybody ever, ever asked me about is, how can I help? Really, I mean, spreading awareness is probably the best thing. Um, most of the problems that I run into is finding infected bees. So if you have hives and you don't mind losing a thousand bees a year, I'd be happy to come have my brother come get them from you. Because <laughs> I will be in the pickup watching until he's done. So there are a couple other roadblocks too. How many people are getting bees right now? Oh, well, we gotta wait till it warms up. This is not a project you can ever do in the fall. This is something you have to wait until April to come about when people are getting their bee boxes in and you can go siphon some bees off the top. None of our hives made it through the winter. My brother quit doing high bees this year. So it makes it really, really hard to get bees from him when he quit. 
But this is kind of where I'll leave you. I want to at least acknowledge a few people here, um, especially the college. They let me, they gave me rooms to put insects in. And they have been more than helpful with funding. Um, Dr. Cruz helps out with whenever I'm whiny and need more space, and he, he kind of facilitates my needs. Um, and then Kimberly, Kimberly, where I work for the National Institute of Health as their coordinator, they give me quite a bit of funding. Um, and then Forest Biotech is our is the company now that holds the patent for our BAPSES, and it works out well for them. I do most of their EPA studies, so they give me free reagents and I do a little bit of work for them and um, we get to do a lot of trials because we have a lot of undergrads. The students that specifically worked on the honeybee project they're all no longer at Fort Hayes. This guy is in his second year of med school, this lady's in her first year of med school and this gentleman is in his second year of his PhD program. There are a lot of students that work with me um, on aphid projects, on bee projects, on the feral pig project. Most of the feral pig project is for graduate students. Um, really hard to get people excited to kill a pig, uh, and grad students don't have a choice. <laughs> so it tends to uh, tends to work out for us. But uh, and then lastly, you know, my my family lets me play with things that and go to the lab on weekends because somebody has to take care of the insects. So even on summer break, even on Christmas vacation, somebody has to go feed the insects. So and, and the insects are nice too. I had a colony collapse myself for my specific organism I work with with aphids we had to have them flown in from Arkansas and the USDA flew to Hayes and delivered aphids a thousand aphids in a jar thank you taxpayers they did that for free um, otherwise you'd have to go to Poland to get that specific sequenced insect so with that I'll open it up for questions if you have anything I'm happy to answer them